Hey, would you guys go ahead and pull out your Bibles? We're going to be in Acts chapter 12. We're in the middle of a sermon series called Exponential, looking at the second half of the book of Acts. The first time we looked at the book of Acts, we were uh, looking at how if we take a step in our spiritual journey, as we did that, it was going to create momentum in our life. And as we look at the second half, what we've noticed in there is that whenever people take steps in their journey and help other people take steps, we create an exponential life that has an impact far beyond just our small sphere of influence. A little background for you. At this point in the book of Acts, we're about 15 years into the book. So we're 12 chapters in, 15 years. So it's been 15 years since Jesus rose from the dead and went back to heaven. So it's 15 years of the entire history of the church is in that 15 years. And it's been a roller coaster ride. They would have times where they would grow by thousands over a weekend. And then it would be met with massive persecution and people would be scattered throughout the region. So as we pick it up today, we're going to pick it up in one of those moments when it gets rough again. We're going to look at a time when a guy named Herod, who was uh, ruling over the Israel, the area of Israel, as he was leading that time, he led a charge to try and destroy the church again. He, uh, the first thing he did was he took uh, a hold of a guy who was a key leader in the church named James, and he killed him by the sword. And when he noticed that there was a positive response by the Jewish people, he said, this is really good for me, and he tried to... In, in, um, Try to expand that beyond just that, uh, that small area. And we're going to pick this up in verse 3. And look what he says here. When he saw that this met with the approval among the Jews, that means the assassination, of the, the execution of James, he proceeded to seize Peter also. So you have two key church pastors at the time, James and Peter. James has been executed and Peter is put in prison. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers. This guy's so important that he put 16 guards around him. The guy's not armed. 16 guards. He's actually chained between two of them, put in the inside part of the prison, and, and the gates are closed and locked up. Herod intended to bring him out for a public trial. When it says public trial, that means a mock trial. There was no chance Peter was going to survive this. Um, it was, he was going to bring him out after the Passover. So he was probably arrested on a Friday put in prison. They weren't allowed to do public executions on a Saturday because that was the Passover. Uh, he was going to come out on Sunday. And I don't know if you catch the little irony of this, but Passover is when Jesus was killed. So this has been about 15 years. This is what's happening. Jesus is going to um, look at Peter there in prison, and Peter's going to celebrate Easter. And while he's celebrating Easter, it'll be with his execution. But there he is sitting in prison. And I want you to feel the weight of what this means. I want you to feel what it would be like. Imagine if one of your pastors had been executed and another one had been put in prison. Imagine you came to church today and Pastor Ed had been executed and Pastor Paul was put in prison. How would it feel? Would we have church differently than we do right now? I know when you got here, you came in and you looked for your chair and Maybe someone got here before you and now you have to sit in another row and it's really wigging you out and you got your normal church routine, you got your coffee, said hi to the same four people and you sat down. And now imagine if the entire church was shaken because one of our own had been executed and another one of the people that you love dearly is now in prison. You feel the weight of that? I want to give you a little background on this Herod guy. He's a, a confusing figure because the name Herod is used so many times in the Bible with different guys. And to give you a little background so you understand the way this guy thought. It starts with Herod the Great. That's his grandfather. His grandfather was king when Jesus was born. This is the man, Herod the Great, which is a real loose term here. He was the man who killed all of the babies two years and under in the area around Bethlehem because he was trying to kill Jesus. Okay, that's the grandfather of the guy we're talking about. His father, Aristobulus, this guy was killed by Herod the Great because Herod the Great was afraid Aristobulus was going to usurp the throne and take his place. This is a paranoid family. This is an evil family. Herod um, Agrippa is the one we're looking at. He actually spent a number of years in prison in Rome. He was a bitter man. When he comes to the throne, he is an insecure guy who didn't have the approval of his father or his grandfather, and he wants the approval of men. And so when he sees that when you seize a pastor and you kill him, it works well. Now, I want you to imagine what it's like for us as the church. Ed has been executed and Paul's in prison. What are we doing? So who's with me? Let's grab some chains. We'll get some swords and we'll go down to the prison and we'll fight the Roman army. Who's with me? Yeah, me either. Yeah, I ain't going either. Right. Well, what can we do? We only have one option. It's what they did. Peter was kept in prison, but the, but the church earnestly was earnestly praying to God for him. 
The word earnestly doesn't mean that they were really, they were really working hard to fake that it looked like it mattered. They were straining at this. It was breaking their heart. They had no other option but to pray, God, help us out. I always wondered, what was Peter doing at this time? And what he's doing is exactly what I would not be doing. You know, when I go to bed at night, I lay down, and if there's something exciting, I lay awake thinking about it. And if I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it, I wake up and I stay awake. And then if I have something that's stressing me out, I lay awake and think about it, or I wake up and think about it. And sleep is not an easy thing for me. I'm kind of a high-strung guy that's always excited about something or worried about something. Peter seems like me, though. This guy is all over the place. And yet, you know what he's doing when he's in prison? One of his closest friends, James, has been executed, and he's going to be executed within a day. But what does Peter do? He sleeps. He's got a guard on this hand and a guard on that, this hand, and he lays down and he's fast asleep. Look what happens. When all that praying, watch the response. This is what God does. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. And this is so great. If we ever do a play, I want to play the angel, because look what he does. He has to strike Peter. Peter is so sound asleep, so at peace with what's going on in the world that day, that when the light sh shines in there and, a, and an angel comes in, the angel, <laughs> whack! He strikes Peter on the side to wake him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Now picture this. There are 16 guards. An angel comes in and a light shines. He strikes him and talks to him. The chains fall off of him. He gets him up. It actually says that the gate opened on its own. None of the guards see them. None of the guards hear the gate open. None of them hear the angel talk. With a miracle, he walks right out. Now, if you're Peter, this is a pretty exciting moment. But here's what's funny. He doesn't even know what's really happening. Watch this. Then Peter came to himself. He's out in the middle of the city. As soon as they get out in the middle of the city, all of a sudden the angel just disappears. And Peter's looking around going, oh, wait, this is really happening? I don't know if you've ever been in that little world between sleep and awake. This happened, I, almost the exact same thing happened to me, just like Peter, except for the jail part and the angel. But I was laying in, <laughs> take, taking a nap, and um, I heard my son, my five-year-old, yell out that he needed me. And so I jumped up and stumbled to the door. And, I'm, what? What? and I woke to hear my wife behind me laughing, saying, what are you doing? And I said, well, Anderson, need... and she's like, no, he didn't. And I came to myself right there and realized I was in a dream. Okay, that's actually nothing like Peter at all, is it? No. <laughs> Peter finds himself awake, though, and realizes there are no chains, there are no soldiers, and there is no prison. And listen to what he says. Now I know without a doubt that the Lord had sent an angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. And I realized, you know why he didn't know that it was real? Because all through Scripture, we see that there's a pattern of how the angels come. When they show up and the light shines, they always say the same thing. Paul brought it up last week. Don't freak out. Well, this time the angel didn't say it. He just came up and hit him. And so Peter's like, well, this can't be an angel, right? So he gets out and he says, what do you do when you get out of prison and people have been praying for you? You find the prayer meeting. You go say, hey. What's going on? So that's what he does. So Peter, in verse 13, he goes to the door, and this is, they're praying at a guy named John Mark. It's at his mom's house. That's where the prayer meeting's happening. And when he shows up, Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it. Rhoda, you got one job. <laughs> Open the door. She runs back. Peter's at the door. You can imagine Peter going, hey, hey Rhoda, Rhoda. Open the door. Now listen to this. You would think that the church is praying. What are they praying for? That Peter would be released, that God would do something, that he would be saved. And Rhoda comes in and said, it's true. This is what they said. You're out of your mind. Now I figured out why this is happening. Now I, this, I can't prove this biblically, but just doing some background research. If you remember from Easter, Passover came and it probably was on April Fool's. All day long, Rhoda had been making jokes, and so she comes in. Peter's at the door, and they're like, Rhoda, come on, man. You've been playing April Fool's all day long. They're like, you're out of your mind. But she keeps persisting, and they, as they look at this, they said, it's probably his angel or something. And in response, finally, they let him in. So Peter comes in. I want you to imagine 
Pastor Ed has been executed, and Paul comes in after being in prison with the expectation that tomorrow morning he's going to die. How would we respond? That's right, biggest group hug ever. <laughs> Imagine them just, and just wrapping themselves around him, and he, he calms them down and says, hold on, hold on, and he gives them this instruction. And Peter motioned with his hands to them to be quiet and describe how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he, he says, tell James, this is actually the brother of Jesus, not the James um, from earlier in the chapter that was executed, and the other brothers and sisters about this. He said, and then he left for another place. You know, as I look at this, there's a, a number of characters in, in here, and I want us to look at what does it mean to live an exponential life? And as I look to identify with different characters in there, what are the places in my life that have to change, that have to be transformed to live this out? In our life groups, one of the things that we're really big on is when we're looking at a story, we try and say, who do you identify with? Who in the story do you see that your life is similar to? And the reason we do this is you might find a caution when you look at that person and say, man, I do not want to continue living like that. Or you'll see someone who lives um, with actions that you envy. You're like, I want to be more like that. Well, in this story, I was thinking how there's Rhoda who forgets to open the door. And there's the church that prays. There's Peter who has the faith in prison to sleep. And then there's also Herod. And, and sadly, as I looked at the story, I found myself identifying mostly with Herod. And I know you're thinking... The evil guy? Yeah, I think it's really tempting when you read Bible stories to identify with the good guys and say, ah, yeah. But you know, in actuality, what, what Herod was looking for is the thing that I often look for too. You see, Herod did this whole thing seeking the approval of men. And I find that I do the exact same thing. And I find that when you seek the approval of men, you'll do it in one of two ways. You'll do it in one way where you will hide and you will prevent people from knowing who you really are because if they saw who you really were, they wouldn't approve of you. And then on the other side, you end up in competition where you want to make sure that you look better than other people so that you'll win the approval of other people. Earlier this week, I was talking with a friend of mine, and here at Family Church, one of the things we're committed to, deeply committed to, is that every person is impacting someone else, that we're constantly discipling and mentoring other people. And a friend came to me and said, hey, of all the people that you've mentored, did any of them become competitive with you? And I thought through them. I thought through Derek and Sabin, and no, they weren't competitive with me. And Josh, and I was thinking about my time with Drew and Jason and Zach, and I thought, no, none of them were. And he said, man, I got one that's competitive with me. And then I stopped, and I felt that Holy Spirit whisper in my heart, and he said, why don't you go ahead and tell the truth, Will? And I realized as I stopped and thought about it, none of the people that I've mentored have become competitive with me. But when Paul was mentoring me, I was very competitive with him. And I remember whenever Paul said certain things, there were things where I would challenge and there were things that he would do or as I did something, as he challenged me, I would challenge back, partly because there was conflict between, because I wanted to show that I had the approval of men and if I could prove that I was as good as, can we do this again? <laughs> hey, thanks for praying for me being in jail. Yeah, welcome back. <laughs> They did not look like they were straining a bit. I know. <laughs> Maybe they were still mixed. <laughs> this reminds me of a great story. Uh, Jan and I were going to buy a bicycle, and Will was hanging out with us. And so years ago, we went into Walmart, and we were looking. They had a great sale on bikes, and we hadn't gone preparing to buy them. We were just still shopping. But you found a good deal. Yeah. It's so like, let's buy them. Uh, but we don't have any way to get them home, and there's no trailer and whatever. And Will said, let's ride them home. That was a dumb idea. It's been like 15 years. I'm still tired. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Roseburg to Sutherland, just, just take off, ride a bike. Why not? So I said, yeah, let's go for it. So we're riding this bike and companionably talking and going along, and we get to about Winchester. <laughs> and, you know, the bridge, and we cross that, and we take a minute there, and he says, I'll beat you home. You know, I, I thought we were on the same team. Come to find out, we were on competing teams. I didn't realize that. So mm -hmm. what did you do? Every time we went up a hill, I beat him up that hill. <laughs> and I'd wait for him at the top and look down on him smugly. <laughs> and then what did you do? Just stroke, 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 just gear down. That's what gears are for, you know. And uh, So what happened when we got to Sutherland? <laughs> Not mentioning any names, but somebody was kind of out of gas already, and so <laughs> when we were passing Sutherland Feet, I just picked up the pace a little bit and... Left me in the dust. <laughs> what made it really rich is the girls had gone home early, and they had chairs set out and a finish line and signs. 
It was all gone by the time I got there. <laughs> it was kind of dark by the time you got there. Yeah. Well, if you want to finish the sermon, Paul, that'd be great. But, but I was thinking what you said, how wonderful it is when we challenge each other in a good way and push each other on, and, and competition can have that good effect. But way too often, it's about somebody winning and somebody losing. I had a pastor in college. I remember where I was sitting in the auditorium when he said to us, never compare. Someone always loses. Yeah. And it was me in that case. <laughs> but you know something funny? Okay. What, what I so appreciated if someone became competitive with me, it would be so tempting to buy into that and be competitive back. And I was thinking if Paul had done that with me, I think it would have destroyed me. Yeah. But you didn't. You just beat me. <laughs> 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 but you never egged it on. You, cha you challenged it by simply being gracious, being gracious. And sometimes when I would challenge you in that competitive way, you were gracious with me. And I'm so grateful yeah. that you were not like me. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Never compare. Someone always loses. <laughs> See that, Paul? They're still cheering for you. <laughs> Never compare. Someone always loses. We have that little axiom in our home where if you ask my kid, if you say the word never compare, you know what will follow? They will answer. Someone always loses. And it doesn't mean we don't play sports. We don't play games where there is a winner and a loser. And we work on being good winners and being good losers whenever there is a fun competition. But if that is the heartbeat, I have to beat you to prove I have value, it will destroy them both. As I thought about this, it really comes down to where your eyes are. And if you're going to live an insecure life where I have to compete with you to show that I am better, really it's because my eyes are on me. Let me ask you the simple question, where are your eyes? You see, you can't have your eyes in two directions at one time. I can look in this direction. I can look in this direction. I can't do them both at the same time. If I'm going to look this way, I can't see you over here. The same thing's true with not only our actual practical eyes inside of our physical body, but also in our spiritual eyes. If you're going to look at yourself, you can't also look at others. And if you're going to look at yourself, you can't look at the mission. If you're going to look at yourself, you can't look at him. You cannot look at God. It's got to be one or the other. And I ask you this simple question, where are your eyes? We're going to look at the, the life of Herod. He starts off, well not the beginning of his life, but it starts off the story by executing James. And he sees that people like that. And there's this horrible response in his life where he follows after that. At the end of the chapter, we actually see his demise. Look what happens here. He goes in front of a group of people and he gives a speech. When he gives a speech, this is their response. And this is some serious flattery here, okay? I don't think they really believe this. They said to him, this is the voice of a God, not of a man. Don't say that to your husband, by the way. This is totally overboard. If you're going to flatter, find something else to do. And immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. Bring a little clarity to this. Junior hires love this story. It's not that he got struck down in the ground and be eaten by worms. He actually died of worms, like tapeworm, eaten from the inside out. Here's what, what I see in this. This is a really big deal. And when your life is about what other people think of you, either those that are trying to avoid being seen because they don't want to look bad or those who want to beat everybody else so they look good, you are at the center of your life. And I ask you the simple question, where are your eyes? And I would love to say that I am not like Herod in that. But if you take an honest look at it, perhaps you too are living your life in view of other people because you care more about what other people think, what they'll say about you, then you are the actual Prince of Peace. What allows Peter to sleep and Herod to die? I think it's where their eyes were. You know, I see that Herod sought the approval of men, but I also see the church responding, seeking hope. And we see this right away. When, um, when Peter ends up in prison, their response is that the church was earnestly praying to God for him. As I look at this, one of the things that, that I think comes out, though, is you see that there's a problem, right? And what's the response to problem? It's prayer. And when you have a problem, it leads to prayer. What will always happen? Power and freedom, right? Because God delivers us from, doesn't he? When you're seeking hope, notice that God delivered Peter from the prison. He delivered him from the execution. But here's where there's a, a simple problem. What happens when there is a problem and we pray and there's still a problem? You see, sometimes God delivers us from issues, and sometimes he delivers us through, and it doesn't change 
anything. And then here's what you're left to ask. If there's a problem and there's prayer and there's no answer, what does it mean? Is it a problem with my heart? Is it a problem with God? How do we get through a situation like that? You know, I saw a terrible story that was just like that. There was a woman that had cancer and she was struggling and, and her life was, you know, on hospice. She was, she, was short to li- she was shortly to die. And so some people that really believed in praying for healing, a church that came out and they wanted to pray for her, they gathered around, they prayed for a whole, like, an hour or two in an evening at her house, and, and it was this real trying to pray earnestly for God's healing. And then they went away, and they checked back in a week or two later, how are you doing? And she had gone to the doctor, and she said, the cancer's still here, and I'm still, I'm still dying. This is still the same process. So you have a problem, and you have prayer. There's still a problem. Yeah. What was their response? One of them said, well, I guess the problem is you don't have enough faith. So, so the logical problem here is not only now are you sick and dying, but it's your fault because you're the one that didn't have enough faith because the formula says that if you have enough faith, then God always provides what you're asking for. Yeah, the, the belief system was always delivered from. Yeah. Well, what, what happens with the delivered through? You know, it takes just as much faith in fact, sometimes I think it takes more to believe that God can take you through the situation and that you can trust him and that he can be a part of your life in that. It takes faith and God can be glorified just as much in that as in the other. I remember it just as you were saying that, the idea that it takes more faith sometimes to walk it through. Because here's what inevitably you will ask if there's a problem and then there's prayer and there's still a problem, you will ask this question. If that's true, then why is God still good? I remember... Um, Mark Jackson was a basketball player. This is probably 20 years ago, and he, his father had passed away. And in the process of, of how he was handling that, with tears in his eyes, someone pressed on him, like, well, how can you keep playing when, when your father died yesterday? And he said, well, God is still God, and God is still good. And that, that's the hardest part of this, is if there's a problem, and then there's prayer, and there's no answer, what feels like the not the answer I want, how do you still have faith in the middle of it? Delivered from but also delivered through. I see this play out in Peter's life. In the story we're talking about from Acts 12, this is the second time he's been in prison. Early on, he was in prison with John. The two of them were put in prison, and they were freed miraculously. Then he's freed miraculously again. Well, here's what's interesting. Looking historically, there's another time when Peter ended up in prison. We had the same problem of prison. I'm guaranteed there was prayer. But the answer was Peter's own crucifixion. At the end of Peter's life, he was put in prison again, and prayer happened. But he was executed. And let me ask this question. If God is still God and God is still good, then why was it the end so brutal? In fact, um, Peter, wanting to honor Christ in his death, said, Would you please hang me upside down? I don't deserve to die the same death as my Lord. And so this is what you're seeing is actually him being raised upside down. In Peter's execution, I asked that simple question. Where was God when Peter was executed? The same place he was when his son was executed. When I was in um, a junior in high school, I went to a small Christian school, and in that year, we lost two young boys, one to a car accident, one to a shooting accident. And one of the, the, the mother of the, the second boy that died was heartbroken. And she went to the father of the boy that died earlier in the school year. And she said, where was God when my boy died? And with that gracious moment of the Holy Spirit speaking through him, he said, the same place he was when my boy died. And the same place he was when his boy died. God is still God and God is still good. And the end does not tell you whether or not he loves you. It's his grace to walk us through it. And I see this um, in Peter. See, between the time when Peter was in prison and his execution, one of the things that he did is he wrote a number of letters, a couple of them out to the church. And in that, he talks a lot about how do you handle when life doesn't go your way, when life breaks down, when life falls apart. How do you handle suffering? I think this is how he was able to sleep in the midst of a jail cell. This is what he says in 1 Peter 2, 23. He's talking about Jesus and how he suffered And how his heart was. Look at this. When they hurled their insults at him, that's Jesus, he did not retaliate. And so Peter takes a nap. Why? Because I've seen the pattern here. I know how this goes. No matter what they do, 
I know who's in charge. He didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Jesus didn't retaliate. Jesus made no threats. Instead, he entrusted. If you have your Bible out, underline that word. Entrusted himself to him who judges justly. I can sleep because I know who's in charge. And whether I live or I die, I know who holds my life and my death in his hand. Is God good even when the circumstances are not? So as we look at this, we see that some were seeking approval, as Herod was, and the church was seeking help. One of the things I thought so interesting about the church is while they were earnestly praying because they had no other option, there was still a growing moment for them. We're talking about this exponential life. If you seek the approval of men, it will destroy an exponential life. If you have a, a heart that is seeking hope, you will be amazed at what God will do in and around and through you. But here's the other thing I would notice about that church. When Peter got there, not only did Rhoda forget to open the door, when she came in and said, Pastor Paul's at the door, the church didn't run to the door. There wasn't a mob scene as they rushed to go give him a hug. They said, you're out of your mind. Why? Because they still lacked the faith to believe that the very thing they were praying for, that God had the power to do. And in the midst of that, I want you to ask this question. It's quite possible that you have been praying for something and you have been asking, God, do this miracle in my life. And he's already given the answer, but you haven't opened the door. Let me give you this challenge. Open the door. You've been praying that God would heal you from the bitterness. There's been an option to take a restoration class that will help you walk through that. But you haven't signed up. In fact, in green, I want to challenge you. I know that some of you, you are in a lot of pain. You are hurt emotionally. On the 24th, we're starting a new class. You can mark that on your card or you can sign up out in the lobby. Don't miss the chance to open the door. For some of you, you've been praying for your neighbor, but you haven't opened the door and said, would you come with me? Would you like to go to coffee? You haven't made that next step. So often the very thing we're praying for, God has right in front of us. We want to serve and be used by God, but we're not willing to step out and say, where do you need me? Your, your community is desperate for people like you to step in and serve. Your church has places where you can be a part of serving and pointing people towards Christ. You want to be a part of it. You're just not opening the door. So my challenge for you, open the door. Let me pray for us. First, I'm actually going to release to the Green Campus. I love you guys. And um, happy Mother's Day to you, especially Crystal. You're the best mom I've ever met. And actually, I'm actually going to give you a couple challenges before I, um, we pray. The first one is I want you to do this thing that we've been talking about. If we're going to live an exponential life, it means we're going to get out of our own way and be a part of what God's doing. And that means I want you to pray for your neighbor. Uh, I was talking with a friend of mine, and one of the ways he does this is whenever he feels like he is struggling with anger, he starts praying for his neighbor. So think about wherever you struggle with something, maybe you struggle with anger or you struggle with lust, or you struggle with some area, whenever your mind starts to go in that direction, Instead, pray for your neighbor. I'll tell you one thing. Satan will stop messing with you on that other thing because the last thing he wants is for your neighbor to come to Christ. But I want you to start praying for your neighbor. The second thing that I want you to do is I want you to see where you need to open the door. Where is that spot where God has called you, where you've been challenged, and you're simply not doing it? Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, I pray for those of us in the room who are afraid to step out because we seek the approval of men and we're afraid that we'll look bad. God, I pray that you would give us the freedom to have our eyes on you and in that we can step forward and say, I may not look like the best, but I'm willing to serve. And Lord, I pray for those who in that same vein on the opposite side, they're living a life of competition so that, that maybe they could feel like they can win approval. God, I pray that their approval would come from you and not from those around. God, I also pray for those who are seeking hope. I pray that you would train us in that, that as things fall apart, as, as there is a problem and then there is prayer, that that prayer would be deep and it would be earnest. And no matter what the outcome, you would help our hearts to trust you, whether or not you're delivering us from something or you're delivering us through something. Walk us through the pain with grace. And God, I pray for those of us who are wanting to be a part of something special. We want to live an exponential life. I pray that you would help us to open our eyes and open the door. In your name we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here. And you're 
uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life. That's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks. <laughs>